Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where I think at one point or another, or maybe it's every day, we've all dreamed of going to space as an astronaut. And today we're going to learn how to make that dream a reality from someone who has done it himself. I'm Brian here at Varsity Tutors Mission Control, and I'm joined here by Leland Melvin, who a lot of you know and love already, who's visited the International Space Station twice. In fact, as we uh, heard from him uh, about a month ago, he helped to build it. Um, he did all that as an astronaut, and uh, he's going to tell us all about how to make it happen. I'm also joined here by a whole bunch of Astra not yet in uh, the Varsity Tutors Space Club. Uh, space Club, you want to wave and say hello to everybody? We practiced this. We've got launch. Awesome. Perfect. Um, so we've got our space club here to, uh, to help us out. And as you can see from our space club, we want to make this really interactive. This session is all about helping you live out your dream of becoming an astronaut with Leland's help. We're going to get you that much closer today. So we want to put you in the driver's seat. A couple housekeeping things before I uh, introduce Leland. One, keep it interactive. You'll see to the, uh, the right of the, uh, the, uh, the video box, there's a chat panel there. Leland's going to ask you some questions uh, to find out what you know about space and what, what you want to you know, do as an astronaut. So answer his questions there. Also throughout the class, keep asking questions. And in the last 15 minutes, uh, me, along with, uh, with all the team from uh, Space Club, we're going to interview Leland to get some answers to all those questions. Also, I have a camera nearby. Uh, in about a half an hour, we're going to give everybody an opportunity to lean into the screen and take a selfie with a real live astronaut. If you upload that to Instagram after class and tag Leland Melvin and Varsity Tutors, we'll make sure you have the official instructions toward the end of class. You'll be entered to win a prize package that includes an astronaut patch from Leland, an autographed picture, and a membership in Space Club. So someday you can be part of this live studio audience here with a, a patch like that. So if you want to learn more about Space Club, click on the link on your screen. We'll tell you a little bit more about it toward the end of class. But with all that, I don't know, what does everybody in Space Club think? I think we have clearance for launch. And so, uh, so with that, let me turn it over to your teacher for today, Leland Melvin. Hey, thank you, Brian. It's so great to be back with all of you. And today's lesson is one of my favorites because it's going to be talking to you about what does it mean to have the right stuff? What does it mean for you to be an astronaut? And so who are the astronauts? Qua uh, who's qu what's the qualifications to be an astronaut, right? And then how do you train to be an astronaut? What are the things that you have to do to get to practice in to train like an astronaut, right? And then what do you do? What do you work as an astronaut? Where do you go for your daily job as an astronaut? What do you do 99% of your time? What do you do 1% of your time? These are all the things that I want to share with you so that when you go along on your journey, that you can know exactly what to do. So what classes to take, what things to do right now as a middle school student to become an astronaut. And then the other thing is how you can become an astronaut. When I was your age, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I liked math and science. I was blowing up things and doing things with chemistry and building things, but I didn't know the steps exactly what I had to do and what I had to take to get into this blue flight suit or work on the International Space Station, going up to the space station, looking back at our planet. And so it's really important as you decide on the things that you want to do in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, I call it STEAM education because the arts are so important, math is important, science and engineering are all important. But if you talk about STEAM, it's everything that you love to do. And so now when I think about my class, my astronaut class, who are the astronauts? We have, it was 31 of us from all around the world. It was Americans, it was French, it was German. We had Italians, we had people from Brazil. The first Brazilian astronaut was in my class. And some were pilots, some were uh, geologists, some were scientists, were engineers, all had different backgrounds. And so when you think about playing on a football team or on a soccer team or playing together, everyone has a different skill sometimes. And it's about having different skills where you work together as a team to solve problems. And the problem you're trying to solve is to win the game, right? But for us, our problem that we want to solve is to go to space and help advance our civilization, helping you get better with, if you have diseases, or you want to build a structure, or you want to look at our climate, all these things we do as a class and as a team. And the main thing that we all have in common as astronauts is what? Does anyone know what that thing is? Let me see in the chat. Anyone know? 
what do we all have in common as astronauts? I'm looking at some answers here. Uh, let me see. You all have low haircuts. No, no. If you look in that picture, Sonny, Tracy, the people in the first row, the front row, you know, they have long hair. Marcos Puente is from Brazil. He's got kind of long hair. I, I even have more hair in that picture. Uh, I see here we say scientist. I see you work hard. I see kindness. Those are all good answers. But the main thing that we all have common to each of us is perseverance. And many of you know that right now on Mars, there is a rover that just landed there just recently called Perseverance. Because when the scientists and engineers were building this at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they were doing it through COVID, they were doing it through all these times of things that were going on. And so we had to persevere to make this thing happen, to have people coming together and work together. And the other thing that we have common as astronauts is ingenuity. Anyone know what that is? Ingenuity is when you figure stuff out, when you learn how to do things. And ingenuity is the helicopter that's on the belly underneath Perseverance, the rover on Mars, looking for signs of past life. We're going to have a helicopter flying in the Martian surface. Now, it's a demonstration, so hopefully we'll see that working. It may work, it may not. But that's the one thing we have to do. We have to persevere and we have to be uh, have ingenuity to do these things. And so, so those are two things that we have in common as astronauts. Many of you said a lot of things, uh, no glasses and uniforms. Oh my God, I can't see other people on my laptop. See, some people are having some chats over there that I'm a, I'm a disregard there because you're, you're having some fun there. But then if you also look at, um, kind of like look at my journey um, on this next slide, you'll see before we were astronauts, we were different things. And if you look in my picture on the left, that's my original mission crew. That was me when I was in fifth grade at Perrymont Elementary School. So if anyone's on here from Lynchburg, Virginia, that's a Perrymont Panther, I'm waving to you because I'm an alumnus of Perrymont, Perrymont Elementary School. And you see the peas on our helmets, they have the black and white jerseys, but that was my mission crew. We trained together, we worked together, we had each other's back, we believed in each other, we worked as a team, and that's how we got the wins. And then the bridge that intersected my football playing with my eventual mission crew, STS-122, the space shuttle Atlantis crew right there that you see that we launched in 2008 on Atlantis, was science. In that middle picture, that's me as a little kid. I had a chemistry set, I mixed chemicals together, and I ended up like kind of blowing up my mother's living room. Now, don't do that. You guys don't do that, okay? But it was it was the coolest thing. It got me interested in figuring things out, being an explorer, turning over rocks, mixing chemicals, building skateboards, doing all these things. And those were some of the things that got me ready to be an astronaut, to be curious, to be inquisitive, to figure things out. You know, don't wait for your parents to get the answer. Don't wait for your teacher to get the answer. You do the work, you do the, 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 the investigation and you figure it out yourself. And that's one of the things that many of us bring to the table as astronauts is that curiosity to be an explorer, to look up at the night sky and look around and say, what is that constellation of stars? What is that thing right there shooting across the sky? What is that thing that's around the, the planet that you can see in your telescope? And to be so curious, to, to ask questions, why? Why, why? So that's one of the things that we do as explorers and as astronauts, we ask questions of the why. And we also, we work really hard too. We work really hard. And so on the next slide, you're gonna see, how do you qualify to become an astronaut? Now, how many human beings have been to space? You guys let me know. Is it A, 16? Come on, come on, uh, space club. How many, someone says B. 242. All right. Is it 580 or 17,500 miles? Ah, that's the answer to another question. So the answer is C, 580. And I think Lila got it. Um, if you look at the numbers there, 16 is the number of orbits the space station does around the planet every day. So 16 orbits. And then 580 is the number of people that have actually been to space. And 17,500 miles per hour 
is the speed that the space shuttle travels to get to the International Space Station, and it's the speed that the space station, as it goes around the planet, it goes at 17,500 miles per hour. Now, Brian, what is 242? I don't remember that answer. You remember that? Yeah, that's, um, thank you for asking. I want to know if anybody else knows 242, because we talked about that uh, last time you were with us, Leland. So let me see if uh, people have answers coming in. Actually, I've seen the right answer there. People are starting to say it. Um, What's the right answer for 242? You're one of those. Uh, It's uh, people who have uh, been to the International Space Station or Ah, lived in space. Keith Keith just nailed it here. Yeah, so um, that's, uh, that's that International Space Station. So 242 people have lived on the International Space Station because before the International Space Station, we had the Mir Space Station, we had Skylab, we had people living and working. There was Soyuz Mir where we had, uh, no, Soyuz shuttle where the shuttle and the Soyuz, they docked together. So they were like little mini space stations, but we had more than that living and working in space before that on their own little space shuttle-like thing, I mean, space station-like things, like the Mir and the so use uh, shuttle. But, you know, when you think about this, there are lots of people that are on the ground that are working hard to make sure that we go to space safely. And those people train us. So as astronauts, we're constantly in class. We're learning, we're, we're developing uh, ways of working together as team members. And, and when I think about, you know, that number of people going to space, there's so many more people that are supporting on the ground. Now, what's the next thing that we have, Ryan? It's going to be NASA astronaut qualifications. So many of you are in middle school right now. You're in maybe sixth, seventh, or eighth grade. Some of you are older. Um, For me, I I I got my high school I got my high school diploma. Then I went to college and I got my chemistry degree from the University of Richmond. So I became a chemist. And then after going to the NFL for a little bit, playing a little football. I got my master's degree in material science engineering from the University of Virginia. And so if you look at the the requirements, you see to be an astronaut, you get a master's degree in a STEM field, two years of work experience. So after you get your degree, you can work in an area for about two years, and that gives you the basic qualifications to get into the astronaut corps. You can go in and, and get your PhD, you can get other other knowledge and get other degrees, but that's the minimum requirement. And then you need to pass a NASA physical exam. Your vision, uh, having you know most of your body parts. Um, the other thing that you really need to be able to do is, is handle small spaces. So hopefully you're not claustrophobic. What they do is they put you in this ball and they leave you in there with a heart monitor on and a, head, and a headset. So they can talk to you and ask, are you doing okay? But if you kind of freak out in that closed space, you probably wouldn't be a good astronaut. So that physical exam has a lot of those things. And then you have to be a U.S. citizen. But if you think about this, there's so many other ways to become an astronaut besides just becoming a NASA astronaut. Virgin Galactic, Sir Richard Branson is going to be flying people on his Spaceship One vehicle that will give you you will go suborbital around the planet. So if you get to 70 kilometers up from the planet Earth, you get your astronaut wings. That means you're an astronaut. That means you're now in space. And SpaceX, which made the Crew Dragon, they sent my friends uh, up to space right now. Their, Their SpaceX Dragon is up in space as the lifeboat for them to come home when they're ready to come home. Jeff Bezos in Blue Origin, is another craft that's gonna be taking people to space. And then two other organizations like NASA, ESA, the European Space Agency, they have professional astronauts or government astronauts like the NASA astronauts. And then Roscosmos, that's Russian for the Russian Space Agency. So they're another organization like NASA that we we partner with all these people and work with a lot of them. Like in my class in that picture that you saw, There were ESA astronauts in there. There were Canadian astronauts in there. There are different ways that you can become an astronaut. So so that's the qualification piece. Keep studying hard, study your math and your science, even study your art, because art is really important for understanding how things fit together in a bigger picture. And then qualifications. So what is that next thing besides qualifications that you need? Other universal astronaut qualifications are 
one, being a team player. In space, if you don't work together as a team, you have big problems, you know, because we're living in this lifeboat together. We're traveling at 17,500 miles going around the planet, and we have to work together as a team or things get really bad, really bad. So you don't want to not be a team player. You also have to be uh, a quick learner. Like if you're working on something and you have seven hours of oxygen in your suit and you're outside the space station living and working in your EVA suit, what if something happens? You've got to figure that out quickly on the fly because you only have so much oxygen left to, to be out there. So if something jams, if something floats away, you've got to improvise. You've got to be able to, to make modifications to something quickly so that you can save the day. And then being a lifelong learner, being able to learn anything, whether it's uh, learning how to fly a space shuttle or a space vehicle, learning how to eat upside down in space, learning how to use the bathroom in space. And that's something that you can't train for on the ground. But all of these things you have to do and be willing to do it because if, if there's a malfunction that happens, if something happens in space, you've got to figure out how to make it work because you don't have the ability to just bring someone up like the Maytag repairman to fix it. So you've got to learn it on your own. And then the other biggest thing is being able to work with different cultures and different languages and different people from all around the world. When you look out the space station and you look at the planet, you go around it every 90 minutes, but you're seeing all of civilization down below you. You're flying over the Amazon, you're flying over Mexico, you're flying over Israel, you're flying over all these different places where people have different cultures and languages and they live and work together. We've had Israeli astronauts in space, we've had Muslim, we've had Christian, we've had the whole gamut of people, black, Asian, white, German, French. I mean, it's a, it's a melting pot of people living and working in space. And when you look out the window, you get this change in perspective and the way that you see the people that are on the planet. I saw fires burning in the Amazon. I saw sediment coming down the Nile. I saw hurricanes. I saw all these different things. And underneath all of those things were the people that were living and working. Think about your neighborhood where you live. I probably flew over your neighborhood where you live and looked down in that vicinity of where you lived and thought about you one day maybe coming up and doing that yourself. So that's one thing about you know flying in space is that you get to work with people from all over the planet and you live and work in harmony together. All right. And so that's uh, one thing. Here's another question for you guys. Training to be an astronaut. What did we call the reduced gravity airplane I flew on to train for space missions? Does anyone know? Anyone on the chat? Which one is it? I see someone says B. I see Jacob, Sophia, Benjamin, they all say B. Uh, we got A, the pressure cooker. We've got B, the vomit comet. I see someone says E, the centennial falcon. And I see D, the absurd bird and the insane plane. The answer is B. And the reason we call it the vomit comet is also called the microgravity airplane. The airplane flies a parabola. Anyone ever been on a roller coaster, you know that at the top of the roller coaster, you actually are in microgravity. Your stomach, you feel your stomach actually floating because you have a seatbelt on and you're held down in the, in the roller coaster, but your stomach is able to float within in your belly. And so you feel that gravity, you feel that microgravity. And in the airplane, we fly over this parabola and we get 25 seconds of weightlessness. And over that 25 seconds, if you're floating on the ceiling, when we come out of the 25 seconds of weightlessness, you fall to the earth very quickly because the gravity is now pulling you down. And some people can't handle the up and down and all around because we do this 40 different times. And so some people actually get sick. And if you see my flight suit right here, I've got a pocket right here. I put my bag in that pocket so that I could quickly have it in case I got sick. And many astronauts get sick in space. So we just have to do our business, clean it up and keep moving on and, and, and work on the mission because we have a mission objective to solve problems and do those things. And if you get sick, you just, you just let it go and you keep moving forward. So it's called the vomit comment. So good, good answers there. 
Another thing we do is astronaut training. It's just not flying jets and flying around, but it's all these other things. I had never flown an airplane before. I got to NASA and they put me in a, a little Cessna propeller plane. They gave me about 20 hours of training. I was flying around, doing stalls, flying up in the air. And then they put me in the back of this high performance military jet called a T-38. This jet flies Mach 1.3. It's 1.3 times the speed of sound. So we're flying about 800 miles an hour, 900 miles an hour. And we're flying up at 45,000 feet. When you're flying that high and you're holding the stick, any little deviation of the stick that controls the airplane can make it go up or down like this. And so when you're flying and air traffic control is, is monitoring you, you, you can't deviate more than 100 feet either way or you'll get violated. So you have to be really focused, really concentrating on flying perfectly, flying exactly. And that's the same kind of training that we do to get ready to fly an International Space Station with the space shuttle connected um, up in space. So flying is one thing. Another thing we do is we do EVA training, extravehicular activity training or spacewalks. In your white suit, You we do this in a pool that's 5 million gallons on the ground. So in that middle picture, you see the neutral buoyancy laboratory, the NBL, that's where you float and you're neutrally buoyant in a pool and you have a submerged space station, space shuttle and other vehicles in there for you to simulate like you're walking in space. Now, when I was in space, we didn't have a doctor on our, on our crew. And so I volunteered to be the crew medical officer. And so part of the training that I had to do was learning how to sew people up, learning how to irrigate people's eyes, to give medicine, to do all these different things in case someone got sick or someone got hurt. Sometimes when you're floating in space that you can like bump into the edge of a corner and you can hit your eye, you can cut yourself or do something. And because you, if you're the first time flying in space, maybe you haven't had a chance to really understand how to control your body in this microgravity environment. So it's really important for you to protect yourself. Maybe there's something floating towards you that may hit your head and cut your head, but I had to learn how to sew people up and take care of people's uh, little wounds and things. So I train as a, as a kind of, not as a doctor, but as like a, a crew medical officer. And then the other thing we have to do is many of you play sports and do things. So you have to learn how to be a good team member, but we have to learn to be, to have good expedition behavior. And what expedition behavior is, is you're a good teammate as you're exploring in space. And so one of the things we train on the ground for expedition behavior is we went to Alaska and we kayaked for 10 days in the, in the ocean, in the sound. And we had to find, we had to, we had to go to these islands and find water. We had to work together as a team. We had something called leadership in followership. We all know what a leader is, someone who's leading the group of people to do something. But followership is when you can follow that leader and not get in his or her way. You can be a good, you know, a good helper for that leader. And then later you can switch roles and be a leader and they can follow you. So it's important when you're on a mission, if I'm flying the robotic arm to install the Columbus laboratory, that the person who's supporting me they're following me and I'm in charge and I'm leading it, but maybe we switch roles and then they lead and I follow them. So as you go through your journey to be an astronaut or whatever you're doing, make sure you can be a great leader, but also be a great follower too. And that's, that's really important. So that's part of the training that we do to become astronauts. And then on the next slide, you'll see how we actually get ready for doing the job as an astronaut in space. What do astronauts do in space? So when I was on my first mission, here's Randy Bresnik and I. Randy and I were on the flight deck of the space shuttle. So in front of us, there's a commander and there's a pilot. Now, I'm asking you guys now, what do astronauts do in space? What is the job of an astronaut? What do you do? Anyone know? Okay, I need some answers. Give me some answers here. What is what does an astronaut do in space besides just float around? I see spacewalk, I see study, I see explore, I see science experiments. Okay, that's good. 
What else? Learn stuff, study ET life, ET, what extraterrestrial life. I mean, we are looking for signs of, of life on Mars right now, right? And uh, it's important that we do a lot of different things of exploring back to our planet to make sure that our planet is safe. And so we do experiments on plants, our bodies. One of the things that we have to look at is how do our muscles and our bones interact in long duration, um, in long duration space? We had a friend of mine, Scott Kelly, who went to space. He was up there for a year. And we wanted to look at how all of his bodily functions work, how his eyes, how his heart. When you're in space, your heart actually, it gets smaller. It doesn't have to work as hard because gravity is not pulling the blood out of your heart down to your feet. So in space, the blood can move up much more easily than it can on the ground. So your heart doesn't have to work as hard. So your heart shrinks down in size. And so what does that mean for future missions, longer duration for three years? If we went to Mars for three years, what would your heart be like? What would your other, other organs in your body be like? What would your brain be like? We're finding that in space, your eyeballs, because there's no gravity, the eyeballs actually change shape. So if you didn't wear glasses on the ground, you might have to wear glasses in space. And so these, these medical things that we have to study so that we can go further than the moon and maybe get to Mars, and maybe one day one of you will go to an exoplanet, which is you know, billions of miles away when we get new technology that you, maybe one of you will develop. So, so those are some of the things, building space stations, building habitats on the moon and Mars. Those are all things that we're going to do as astronauts. And maybe we'll have the first woman on the moon with the Artemis program. Now, the life of an astronaut, many of you think that being an astronaut, you're always flying in space. 1% of the time, you are flying in space. Just 1%. 99% of the time as an astronaut, you are supporting other people on the ground that are flying in space. So if you look at these pictures, the one on the left with me with food floating around, that's on the space shuttle. And that's all the food that I eat on one for one day on the space shuttle. And the one above me is Bobby Satcher. I'm flying the robotic arm. How many of you out there are robotic arm operators, know how to use a robotic arm? or know how to use hand controllers or video games. Well, I had him on the end of the arm and I was putting him up to work on this thing called an end effector. An end effector grabs something and pulls it along. And Bobby was an orthopedic surgeon. So what better person to work on the end of a robotic arm than an orthopedic surgeon? And if you look at the other top picture on the right, we have Jeff and Nicole looking out the windows of the Russian segment and they're actually taking pictures of the earth below us, looking at hurricanes and storms and just how the earth is changing while they're in space over the course of the time. We have a whole database of images that you guys can all go look at. It's astronaut imagery. Just Google astronaut imagery. And you can see a lot of the pictures that I took on my mission. You can see pictures that astronauts have taken from, I think, even from like the 70s, from the Apollo program. So take a look at that. And in the bottom picture is Butch Wilmore. Butch is, he was the pilot on my second mission on Atlantis. And we were both doing some training on the ground. And we, I think we were doing something to get ready for our mission, but sometimes we're doing the training to help other astronauts get ready for their missions. And so those are kind of 99% of the time you're training or on the ground, getting someone else ready and 1% you're flying. So that's kind of the job of an astronaut from on the ground and in space. And I think uh, many of you are getting ready for your training right now and the classes that you're taking. Um, and, and, but we need you to be doing other things like experiential things, building things, creating things, Legos, models, robots, rockets, all these things that will help your brain get ready for building space stations or, or, or you know, uh, Martian, Martian, uh, lunar, Martian or lunar habitats. And so, cause one of you are going to be up there one day. So I think that's, that's critical for the future of you guys as being an astronaut. Now I got another question for you. How can you become an astronaut? That's section five. Someone is going to be the Neil Armstrong of Mars. What are they doing today? You guys know? 
the Neil Armstrong of Mars, what are they doing today? Anyone know? I'm looking for some answers. They're in school. Okay. That might be one of you preparing. That could be an astronaut that's preparing today, or could maybe one of you out there right now, maybe that first person that lives on the Martian surface. Some of you are in middle school. So you're probably what, 13 years old. So if you're 13 years old now, maybe in another 20 years, you'll be 30, 33, right? So some astronauts have been 33 years old. You might be going to Mars at 33 in 20 years. What are all the things that you have to do in your journey to get there right now, to think about becoming one of those people? And I think about, you know, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins, the first people to go to the moon and to walk on the moon. And I think about these are the footprints. These are some of the footprints that were on the moon in the regolith of the, of the lunar soil. What are your footprints going to look like on the Martian soil? It's a red planet, right? We've got rovers up there now, Curiosity, Perseverance. You may have a helicopter hanging out up there. But think about yourself and what it takes for you to get ready to put your boots on another planet that no one has been to before. Think about all the things that you're going to have to prepare, all the things that you're going to have to study, all the lifelong learning, all the friends you're going to make, all the languages you will learn, all the things you will do to get ready to be that next generation of explorers. And I think about that. I think about, you know, one of our classes that we built a rocket racer. Here's a rocket racer that we built that that uses ingenuity and the scientific method. How do I make it go faster? How do I add new wheels a new propulsion system and new things? Those are the things that you as a, as a scientist, as an engineer, as an explorer will do to get you ready for your mission to Mars or to the moon or the future. So with that, I'm really uh, proud, Brian, of what these future astronauts are gonna do. I hope that helped you understand the process that it took for me to become an astronaut some of the things that we do in space, some of the things that we do on the ground, but also it's all about your journey. Stay encouraged, never give up, have that perseverance like the rover that's on Mars right now. Keep the ingenuity. Don't, and always believe in yourself. Sometimes there were moments in my life when things happened where I had to persevere, I had to have grit. Like right now with COVID, we were at home, we're doing these things, but we got to keep going because Life is going to get better. Things will get better, right, Brian? And we're going to have to just keep going and, uh, and believe in yourself. Listen to your parents and your teachers. Eat your green beans. You know, these are all things that I had to do to get myself ready for becoming an astronaut. You got to be healthy. You got to keep your mind sharp. And you got to believe in yourself. So don't give up. Persevere and have ingenuity. And you'll go far. Leland, I am ready to go to space right now. That was, um, thank you. Yeah, the green beans are, are non-negotiable. I see uh, people <laughs> commenting on that. So uh, it's a huge thanks for that. Um, in the meantime, while you're getting ready, while those green beans are being prepared and all those kind of things, it is now time to, uh, to lean into the screen and uh, get a, a selfie with your, with everyone's favorite astronaut with no, no offense meant to Buzz Aldrin or, or some of the other Scott Kelly. Um, so a uh, reminder, get your cameras ready. And, uh, and, and while you're doing that, get, to, get your questions coming in because right after this we're uh, we're gonna get uh you know make sure we get a lot of your questions answered um get your cameras ready if you take this picture with leland which you'll get to do in just a second and, uh, and upload it to instagram and tag varsity tutors and leland melvin um we'll put those hashtag or those tags up on a slide on our way out you'll be entered to win an astronaut patch i think leland's going to show you that right now an autograph picture of Leland um, and a, a free membership in Space Club. And one of the most common questions we had was, how do I get on the YouTube stream? Um, those are all Space Club members. So if, uh, if you don't win the prize, feel free to click that link to learn more about it, um, how you can get exclusive opportunities like this with Space Club um, and uh, learn a ton about space all along the way and prepare to be that Neil Armstrong of, of Mars. So with all that, I think everybody's logged into their phones. So uh, Leland, I'm gonna hand it back to you and uh, let's I'm get ready. those pictures. Thanks, Brian. All right, everyone, we're going to take two pictures. We're going to look, one is looking straight at the camera, but we're going to be saluting this time. So we're going to have a salute because we're all going to get ready for our mission. We're going to salute. So, okay, I'm getting my camera up. Let me see if I'm, okay. 
I need to go full screen, Brian, because I'm 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 see you. <laughs> Let me see gallery. Okay, there we go. All right, ready, Brian? Are you going to salute or not? There we go. Okay, ready. One, two, three. Salute. Picture. Picture. All right. Now the next one we're going to take. We're all going to look up. We're going to look up like we're curious about space, curious about our future. And curious about being that first man or woman to walk on the Martian surface. So here we go. Looking up. I'm going to get a picture too. All right. Three, two, one. Lift off. Everyone get your pictures. All right. Brian, I think we got some good selfies coming uh, on Instagram pretty soon. I think so. That's one of my favorite parts of these classes and going checking out. I know a lot of you dress up and, uh, you know, you have your own homemade flight suits and, and uh, astronaut helmets and everything. Um, so one day you'll, you'll get the real one like Leland's, but uh, we're excited to see those pictures. All right. You guys have been asking a ton of questions and uh, we want to get you some answers. And so um, we've got a ton of these, Leland. Um, one of the most common ones was um, you know, uh, to the extent of what was your favorite thing about being an astronaut? A lot of people predicted it might have been the uh, the low gravity, zero gravity environment. But uh, so a lot of people wanted to know what that was, what that felt like. Um, and even broader, what was your favorite thing about being an astronaut? You know, I think, you know, as being an athlete, playing on a lot of different sports teams, I played baseball, I played football, I played tennis. I think the thing that was really em empowering for me was to work with people from all around the planet. And I went to Germany, I went to Russia, I went to Japan, I went to all of these different countries to train at their locations. So, you know, we have uh, mission controllers in, in Houston, Texas, it's in Johnson Space Center. And that's where all of the astronauts come and train there. But we have other places all around the world. And I got to eat different food, I learned different languages, and I got to learn these different cultures, you know, about how people live and work some of their customs and things. And so I think when I got to space and we had this international smorgasbord of food from all over the world, I had already tasted some of that food. I had already been to those places and we're, we're eating, you know, we're eating food from Russia while we're flying over Russia or flying over Japan or these different places. And so I think working together as a crew, as an international crew, letting our boundaries, no, no boundaries, no borders, it's just all of us working and living together as human beings, as earthlings. Earthlings, that was what it was, as earthlings working and living together. Now, microgravity is a really cool thing also. And when you're floating in space, you have to be really careful not to bump into things and wipe out all the computers that you're going by. So it's really careful to control your body. And if you're an athlete and you jump and you turn and you, you, you do these things, it's much easier to control your body. So, you know, do some, do some sports and things. Awesome. Thanks, Leland. Um, yeah, it sounds like an absolute ton of fun. Um, we're going to do a, you know, a, some of these questions are going to come from our live studio audience from uh, the, the space campers. And so our, our first one of those, um, Jude, I think is, uh, is ready to go. Jude, we're going to have you unmute here. And uh, what's your question for Leland? Do you ever take your dogs on a spacewalk? <laughs> is your name Jude? What, what is your name? Is your name? Yeah. It's Jude. Yeah. It's Jude. Okay. Okay, Jude. Jude, I've been trying to get my dogs to space for a long time. Okay. But when I when I took them in for the picture, they didn't put them in any little doggy, you know, EVA suits or anything. And we need to we need to come up with a way that we can build in a way that doggies can use the bathroom in their spacesuits, right? Because we haven't developed that yet. And so one day we'll have our pets and animals in space. We've had bees in space. We've had mice in space, butterflies, different things, but no cats and dogs yet. And uh, as, as pets, you know, so if you go to Mars one day, we want to figure out a way to get, you have a dog or a cat or an animal, a pet? What do you have? dog and what's your dog's name blue blue so we can get blue up there get a little helmet on get a little flight suit on 
you know, we'll be we'll be living large on Mars with our pets. And I think one day we'll be able to do that. Great, great, great question. Blue, not blue, Jude. Blue. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jude. Appreciate that. Uh, great question. Great answer, um, Leland. So another question a lot of people had was, um, you know, we talked about your favorite thing about going to space. A lot of people want to go to space, but they're a little bit nervous about parts of it. So they wanted to know, you know, uh, did, did how did you deal with, with any kind of fear or apprehension right before launch? Uh, what was the scariest thing for you about, you know, the entire astronaut journey? Can you tell us a little bit about fears you may have had to overcome to get that amazing experience and, and how you overcame them? Yeah, that's a good question, Brian. You know, when you do anything in your life, it's really important to push your fears away. If you train enough, if you have good, competent people around you that are working with you, then you stay optimistic and you and you really hope for the best as you're working. So when I was in the space shuttle, three, two, one liftoff, you know, millions of pounds of fuel and thrust going off. And I didn't get fearful because I had done everything I could to, to, to train perfectly and, and wonderfully. And we got to space in eight and a half minutes with no problems. And so, you know, things can happen. We know that things have happened in the past, but if you start thinking about that and fearing that, that's when you make mistakes. And one of my, one of my uh, astronaut colleagues before I launched in space, he said he made a mistake one time, flipped the wrong switch. And then he, he focused on that so much that he made a second mistake. And so he, his lesson for us was, if you make a mistake, tell everyone you did it, own up to it, but put it behind you because you can make another one and you just keep going and, and try to have a positive attitude, you know, keep, keep everyone, you know, feeling uplifted and helping people out. And hopefully you'll have a safe, have a safe journey. Scariest thing in space. Okay. I'll, I'll be very honest with you. The only thing that you can't train for on the ground is going to the bathroom number two. And remember, in space, everything floats. So you got to be really careful. That was the scariest thing. I, I can imagine because, yeah, you, you said you're, you're working with people from all over the world. You know, you've got these, you know, impressive astronaut colleagues. So um, that's, uh, yeah, I could I could imagine that being uh, being pretty darn terrifying. So um, <laughs> speaking of impressive folks and actually, the, you know, the trust you have, you know, why you don't have to fear. A um, couple of people asked this question, which I, I thought was great. Um, and and I, I think I know the answer. Have you met Katherine Johnson? Yes, I have met Katherine Johnson. She was a good friend of mine. And uh, she's an amazing, amazing person. One of the things about Catherine is that she didn't let people get her upset. She just did her work. She just kept doing her work and she stayed positive. And it wasn't until Catherine calculated the trajectories for John Glenn to go to space and back. He wouldn't go until she did the calculations. He didn't trust the, the computers because the computers were just coming online. The IBM computers were coming online. And, uh, and she said, um, many of you have seen the movie Hidden Figures, but you know, I talked to John Glenn at, at one point when he came back from his shuttle mission. It's a great person, Katherine Johnson. You know, they, were, um, you know, they worked together to, to get the space safely. So she's an awesome woman. And uh, she's, she's no longer with us, but she's with us in spirit. And the key to honoring a woman like Katherine Johnson is to work as hard as you can, do the best you can, and you will make her happy. You will honor her legacy. That's amazing. For those who haven't seen the movie, or, or you know, we want to, you know, a curiosity. Read, there's, you can read the book too. Um, Hidden Figures is, uh, is a great story. Um, for those who didn't quite get the, the Catherine Johnson reference, and, uh, and it's more proof, as Leland talked about, that um, you know, when you're up there, you've got a whole team of people. Ninety nine percent of a job of an astronaut, plus you know, everyone at NASA is to make sure that journey is uh, is safe and, uh, and efficient and all that. Hey, we got one more uh, question from our, our live studio audience with the uh, the space campers. Priya has uh, has got a question for uh, for Leland. So, uh, Priya, we're going to ask you to unmute. And uh, what's your question? Oh, I was wondering, what are the main things NASA looks for in an application? That's a good question, Priya. Do um, you want to be an astronaut one day? Maybe? Yes, okay. So, so the main thing is, uh, are you a good team player? You know, if, 
if I go to space with you on a long duration mission, can I trust you? Can I trust you to be honest about what you're doing? Can I trust you to put everything you can into this mission so we have mission success? Um, to have the ability to learn on the fly. Things happen in space that you will never imagine would happen. Like when I was using the bathroom and things started, you know, I had to take all my time and, you know, to figure out how to get all this stuff back down there. But you have to be flexible. You have to be good natured and you have to kind of go with the flow sometimes. And then um, a lifelong learner, someone who's always willing to learn uh, something new, because in space, if the procedures change, if something happens, we had a case where we had to fix this solar array that had been damaged from a little micrometeorite de debris. And we had to put this, the guy who was the tallest, his name was too tall. He was like, I think six, four, six, three. We had to use him on the end of not even the robotic arm, but on the end of an extension to get him up there. And we had to make these little bow tie things to fix the solar array. We had never trained for that. We had never planned for that. But on the fly, we figured out how to do it. Apollo 13, we had people coming home and there was a canister that exploded. And the people on the ground took all the parts and figured out how to fix it. So you, you learn how to fix things on the fly. And you do it with grace, you do it with dignity, and you respect other people. So all of those things in the astronaut selection process, we look at those things, we talk to her, their references, we talk to their friends, we talk to people all over that have worked with them to make sure that they have that right stuff. Awesome, great, great advice. And that's probably a good place to end it, that kind of always be curious, uh, be a good team player, uh, you know, tinker with things and all those kind of things. Amazing advice tonight, Leland. So uh, it's a huge thank you to, uh, to you to everyone who asked questions. Uh, one of the, the, the hard things about being the host here, it's not that hard, but it's a pretty fun job. You get to hang out with Leland Melvin is you guys ask so many good questions and now uh, we're going to get so many of them into uh, to airtime, but uh, Leland should be back soon. Uh, you know, even reference classes he's done previously. So um, for all of you out there, thank you for uh, for all of your questions and um, participation, all your answers to uh, to Leland's questions. Uh, I think we were people were typing at about seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. Leland, there was a lot of a uh, lot of action in the uh, the chat tonight. Um, for uh, for those of you in Space Club hang out here in the uh, the live studio audience room. Leland's going to do a, a couple more questions um, for uh, for that group here. If you're not a member of Space Club yet, click the link on your screen to uh, to learn a little bit more. And uh, let me also put up the, uh, the contest rules here. Those tags should be pretty easy to uh, to remember. If you want to get those Instagram photos up and uh, tag Leland Melvin and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win um, a spot in space club for, uh, for our next mission. Um, and also that, uh, that astronaut patch and, uh, and an autograph photo of, of Leo and Melvin. So, um, so with that, um, we may wrap up here in a second. Any last, I mean, you've given so many words of, of wisdom, Leo, and I hate to put you on the spot more on time. Any, any last words of wisdom before we, uh, we sign off? Yeah. You guys out there now, I know I talked to those of earlier, you know, we got a lot going on right now but stay positive, stay hopeful, do your work, study hard. And uh, we're going to get through this and we're going to be better for it. And I'm going to see some of you up in space. I'm going to be in my rocking chair, rocking back and forth. And Brian and I are going to be looking and watching you in space, walking on the moon or Mars one day soon. So uh, Godspeed on your journey. And I look forward to seeing you again in a new, a new star course one day soon. Perfect. Thank you, Leland. One more time. Here's that information to, uh, to win the contest if you want a screenshot and have that for the way out. So um, thanks a whole lot, everybody. And uh, Space Club, we'll see you soon.